Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am Dr. Jamil from the Physiology Department and this lecture is in continuation of the Renal Physiology. Actually, this lecture is concerned with the stalling forces and the auto-regulation of the GFR and what are the factors concerning uh, which are controlling your GFR. Stalling forces, actually your filtration process and here we will learn soon, uh, so, uh, sorry, we will learn soon that where we got this figure of the 10, which we have seen in the previous lecture, how we get this figure of the 10. Now, we, I would like to move a diagram. You will see in this diagram that this is your afferent arteriole and this is your efferent arteriole. Now, here you have got different pressures. One pressure is known as the hydrostatic pressure. Hydro means water, static means stationary water. So, what is meant by hydrostatic? Suppose you have uh, got a glass of water and one pressure is at the top of the water that is the barometric pressure. At the top of the glass you have got the barometric pressure and a, a pressure is also present at the bottom of the uh, glass having that water. In the bottom the pressure is one is the, that pressure same that was on the top that is the barometric pressure but in the column of water in the glass is also exerting its own pressure. So we have got more pressure at the bottom of that glass. That's why whenever you are using a water cooler, suppose you are using a water cooler and you put the tap on the bottom of that cooler and whenever you open the water comes out with the pressure. So the hydrostatic pressure is the pressure, barometric pressure plus a column of the water, or column of the water exerting its own pressure. So these two combine together and this always is an outward force. Whenever you open the tap of the cooler, you will find the water is coming out of, out of it. So it's going to push the water out of it. So the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is 60 millimeter of mercury. It is trying to push the fluid, push the plasma you can see, you can well understand the arrow. Try to follow just my arrow, not this reddish dot. I can't remove it from my laptop. So this arrow, this arrow means 60 millimeter of the mercury that is hydrostatic pressure is trying to push the plasma into the Bowman capsule. While on the other side, we have gotten osmotic pressure, that is oncotic pressure or glomerular colloidal pressure. This pressure is because of the albumin. Why the, this pressure? Because once the things are moving, the blood is moving over here and the plasma is going to be filtered out but no albumin is allowed to be filtered out. So proteins, they are going to be accumulated over here. And I have told you in the previous lecture that the albumin is always trying to retain the water with it. So once the albumin is collected over here, accumulated over here, it will try to retain the water over here. In other words, it will not allow the movement of the plasma from here glomerulus to the Bowman capsule. So it will, the arrow is on the opposite side. That means it is trying to retain the fluid within the, within the glomerulus. So this, this force on cortic pressure is opposite to that of the hydrostatic pressure. So there are two forces in the glomerulus. One is trying to push the blood or especially the plasma from the glomerulus into the Bowman capsule. Others are trying to retain the fluid within the glomerular capillaries. These two are opposing to each other. Now move back to, uh, move into your uh, Bowman capsule. Here you find only one pressure, only one arrow. Where is the second arrow? Where is the oncotic pressure? Why not is the colloidal pressure over here? Because here there is no albumin. Albumin is not allowed to move from the, here to here from uh, capillary into the capsule. So the albumin is not there, so the oncotic pressure is not there. Or you can say in other words, oncotic pressure is zero in the Bowman capsule. So in the Bowman capsule, there is only one pressure, that is the hydrostatic pressure. And this is just 18 millimeter of mercury. Now from this diagram, you can well understand that upgoing are the movement, uh, forces which are trying to retain the fluid within the glomerulus, there are two. The one is your oncotic pressure present in your glomerulus and second is the Bowman capsule uh, hydrostatic pressure. So both upward arrows, if you add up these two upward arrows which are trying to push the fluid from here into this area or trying to retain the fluid within this one. 
these two are the forces which are trying to uh, you are which are against the filtration you can say these two forces they are against the filtration and this is the only force which is trying to cause the filtration so if you add these two forces which are trying to retain or resisting forces 32 plus 18 you will get the figure of the 50 so 50 millimeter of mercury is trying to retain the fluid within this uh, glomerulus while the only force 60 millimeter of mercury hydrostatic pressure is trying to push the fluid into the Bowman capsule so if you minus this 50 from the 60 you will get the figure of the 10 here you can say the net fill uh, if you move to the lower portion of this diagram you will see the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is 60 Bowman capsule pressure is 18 minus this one minus and minus this one so 32 plus 18 is will going to be 50 and if you minus 50 from the 60 you will get the figure of the 10 this is the net filtration pressure which we have used in the previous lecture so these are known the starling forces here you can well understand again this diagram just look at this diagram the same as the previous one with the different colors but the things are same and you can get this uh, you can see deductions abstractions and additions all over here the outward force and force uh, there's a big arrow this big arrow is glomerular hydrostatic pressure 60 millimeter of mercury then a very small arrow the plasma oncotic pressure which is trying to retain the fluid this pinkish small arrow 32 millimeter of mercury and then we have got an again a pressure hydrostatic pressure the 18 millimeter of mercury. so if you add this 22 plus with this 32 you will get the 50 and you minus this 50 from the 60 you will get the level of the 10 so these are the stalling forces actually here in this diagram you can easily uh, uh, understand or write down the thing the force is favoring the filtration the major outward force is the glomerular hydrostatic pressure that is 60 millimeter of mercury and the bowman capsule on cortic pressure which is written in this pi b there is a zero there is a major outward force is the zero here and this is the bowman capsule on cortic pressure i have told you earlier that there is no protein in the bowman capsule so this pressure is zero that's why their pressure is zero and force is resisting the filtration that the inward force is the glomerular on cortic pressure is 32 Bowman capsule hydro hydrostatic pressure is 18. So total inward force is 32 plus 18, 50. Net filtration pressure is from glomerulus towards the Bowman capsule is 60 minus 50 is equal to 10. Now you can well understand the stalling forces for the GFR. This, G, uh, this filtration is known as ultra filtration also because this filtration is because of the pressure difference. Now we move to another very important thing which is known as the auto regulation of the gfr auto regulation means that this is the intrinsic property of the glomerulus to maintain the uh, gfr within the normal limit actually the proper definition for this we first go to the proper definition here is the proper definition don't move to downward i will told you everything i will tell you everything in the despite of wide variation in the blood pressure that is mean artery pressure from 70 to 170 or some books says from 80 to 180 that is a hundred of the difference despite of wide variation between the mean arterial pressure your gfr remains constant this is the auto regulation of gfr that is your gfr if your gfr is 8 or if your blood pressure is 70 or 80 or 90 or it is 100 once up to 170 your gfr remains constant there is no change in the gfr this is an intrinsic property of the kidney intrinsic means if you cut down the nerve supply to the kidney even then this property is maintained by the kidney this is auto regulation of gfr let's see how the, if this auto regulation for this auto regulation before this auto regulation we have to see a another very important thing which is known as the juxta glomerular operators this diagram is known as juxta glomerular operators that means an operators or a machine which is very close to the glomeruli it is very close to the glomerulus that's why juxta glomerular operators this diagram is from the guideline juxta glomerular operators actually the nephron is not 
like a stretch thread as we have studied in the previous diagram, illustrated diagram. That diagram is just to make you understand different parts of nephron. Nephron is not like this. Here it can't, can't do the board work. But I can give you an example. If you, uh, if you close your little finger, if you extend your hand and then flex your, uh, your ring finger and your little finger and extend and again flex your thumb. Then you have got only middle finger and the index finger extended. If you make in, in this way, what is you are going to do? You are going to, I will upload a photograph of this one after taking a, a photograph by my mobile. I will upload it in this, I will add in this uh, my PowerPoint. Then if you, you you have to flex your little finger, your index uh, index finger, sorry, your little finger and your ring finger and the thumb and you have to extend your middle and the index finger. Then take the index finger of your other hand and you pass it between these two fingers of the other hand. Your, when uh, your uh, upper part of the loop of Henle, when the loop of Henle is moving up, the thick part of the loop of Henle is moving above, up, it crosses between the afferent and the efferent arteriole of the, your uh, glomeruli. This is your, suppose this is the efferent arteriole, this is the afferent arteriole, and this is the cut section of the thick portion of the uh, thick portion or you can say uh, a, a loop of Henle. This is a cut section. The yellowish one is a uh, cut section of the loop of Henle. Upper portion of the loop of Henle where it is going to join the distal convoluted tubule. So in the rough you can say that we have got the afferent arteriole. Then this is your glomerulus. We have got the efferent arteriole. Then the cells, the cells of your distal convoluted, uh, your uh, loop of Henle and portion of the loop of Henle, the cells which are facing towards the glomerulus, the dark yellow color. These cells, they are facing towards the glomerulus. These cells are facing towards the glomerulus. They become thick, they become large, they have got the broad nuclei, darker nuclei, and they, this epithelium is going to change its name. Its name is now macula densa. This macula densa is going to, this is act as a chemosensitive area, chemosensor. They are going to sense the amount of the sodium coming up into the filtrate. And these cells, where, where my arrow is there, if these cells, these cells are known as the juxtaglomerular cells. These cells, they act as a baroreceptor. They check the pressure coming into the afferent and efferent arteries. And their other function is to produce the renin. Renin is very important. Renin is going is the enzyme is going to convert the angiotensinogen which is coming from your liver. And angiotens, angiotensinogen uh, is going to be converted into the angiotensin 2 after passing through the lungs. And then angiotensin 2 is very powerful sodium retaining hormone. Very powerful sodium retaining hormone. And second thing is that it is a powerful vasoconstrictor the angiotensin 2 and it, uh, more than you can see 100 brands are available in Pakistan based upon this angiotensin 2 and this is a combination of this angiotensin 2 blockers are available just to down the blood pressure just for the treatment of the hypertension I will, I will give you the details of all these things so dexter glomerular cells they act the baroreceptor and sense the pressure in the afferent the efferent arteriole and produce a renin the macula densa cells act as a chemoreceptor and sense sodium concentration coming up into the filtrate. Now, a very important thing that if autoregulation is not there, it's not present. Normal GFR is 180 liter per day. Normal reabsorption is 178.5 because you, are, you pass only one and a half liter per day. Remaining amount is 178.5 liter is has to be reabsorbed daily. Now, so the urine produced per day is 180 liter and this is a subtraction of this 80, 180 minus this 178, you produce one and a half liter per day. Now, if your blood pressure increase, keep in mind the definition of the autoregulation. That means 
autoregulation means if your blood pressure varies from 70 to 170, your GFR remains normal. And if this autoregulation is not there, suppose your blood pressure increased by 25%, that is from 100, it becomes 125. So 25% is increased in your blood pressure. Now if, so the GFR should be increased by 25%, that is from 180 liter, it should move to the 225 liters. Now if you produce if your reabsorption remains constant, that is 178.5 liter, then the urine you will produce, you can well imagine, if you subtract 225 minus 178.5 liter, then you have to produce 65 liter approximately per day if this autoregulation is not there. Just by raising your blood pressure by 25%, you have to pass such a huge amount of the urine. That's the beauty of the autoregulation of the GFR. And this juxtaglomerular operators plays a very important, you can see the key role in the autoregulation of the GFR. This, uh, this, this, actually, this is a machine, or you can say operators, which is provided with the each nephron. And this is very important for the autoregulation of the GFR. How it is going to regulate this one autoregulation? Now, diagram is in front of you, but you please move with me. I am saying something, you follow me, and you can well understand the thing. Suppose a boy or suppose a person has got a roadside uh, accident and he has got strong, uh, you can say, heavy bleeding fr uh, from one of his arteries. Now, once the blood is lost there, once the bleeding is there, do you think so the blood pressure will increase or decrease? Definitely blood pressure will decrease because volume of your blood is decreased, so pressure will decrease. So if you suppose you have got a tank over the roof of your house, if the water is amount of you can say volume of the water is decreased in that tank, definitely the pressure in the pipe will be reduced. So when you lost the blood in a roadside accident or in any operational procedure, definitely your blood pressure is going to down. Now when the blood pressure will go down. Would you think so that the blood supply to the kidney will go up or down? Definitely it will be lower down because you have got low blood pressure due to the blood loss then the blood supply to the kidney is going to be reduced now. Now keep in mind that the kidney has got very very you can say good, good sympathies or they sacrifice their blood supply to the vital organs like heart and blood whenever it is required. So much so the kidney gets failed itself. Renal failure is there. The kidney blood supply is reduced to so much, so up to such an extent that it gets failed, but its supply is moved towards the where the heavy supply, which is normally supply, heavy blood supply, which is normal towards the kidney, is moved towards your vital organs, the brain and the heart. So you have lost the blood in an operational procedure, you decrease your arterial pressure and blood supply to the kidneys also decrease. So when the blood supply to the glomeruli they are decrease, what do you think that the hydro what will happen to the hydrostatic pressure? Definitely it will be decreased because you have got no blood. When the blood is less, pressure will decrease, arterial pressure will decrease and glomerular hydrostatic pressure will decrease. When hydrostatic will pressure will decrease, the GFR has to be decreased now. And now we are going to study how you are going to reverse this GFR to the normal. It should be decreased up to this arrow, up to this area. GFR should be decreased. But kidney, they are trying to minimize it. Kidney trying to reverse it how it is possible. Now from here onward, we have to see another very important thing which is concerned with your next chapter. Which is concerned with your next chapter, I have to move to that diagram. Wait a minute. Here, here is a diagram that here is your capillaries, there is a lumen and 
the things have to pass from the tubular cells into the interstitial fluid then into the capillary this is a process of reabsorption the reabsorption means that anything which has to be reabsorbed it has to move from the lumen and it enters into the tubular cells then it has to enter into the interstitial fluid and then it has to enter into the peritubular capillary network so sodium is the leader for the reabsorption this is the key centers for you sodium is the leader for the reabsorption major part of the reabsorption that is the 65% of the reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule and it is led by the your sodium sodium moves from here in different pathways i will tell you in detail i am not concerned at this moment because i want to make you understand the auto regulation of gfr so what happens when the you have got low blood pressure due to blood loss you have got low gfr that is blood splatter the kidney is lower down so when the blood flow to the kidney is lower down do you think so that the blood flow to this lumen will increase in speed or decrease in speed think by yourself the blood flow will increase or decrease i will you i am going to give you an example so suppose you have got a glass of water and you have got a spoonful of water you can say a, a teaspoonful of water if you throw both of them what will flow with more speed glass of water or spoon of water definitely water within with the glass or you can say water present in the glass will move with a faster speed because it got more mass it will move faster as compared to the water spilled out from your spoon so here you have got water here you have got blood loss so fluid or your fluid on the lumen or you can say the infiltrate will move at a lower speed speed of the fluid will be lower down in the this area in the lumen so when the speed will be lower down then this sodium reabsorption will automatically more this is quite difficult for you to understand uh, because in this slide we can't do a board work but i will try to give you an example suppose a belt is moving in front of a salesman and on the belt there is a water bottles they are coming out and a salesman is standing there or you can say worker is standing there they are trying to uh, pick that bottle and putting it uh, from that belt into a box so the speed of the belt is there and the person is picking up that bottle and and, and putting it in the box now if the speed of the bot if the speed of the belt is reduced then the person can easily pick more bottles from the belt that means the more sodium can be reabsorbed from here so when the more sodium is reabsorbed so in the lumen sodium will be less sodium will be less now i will move to another diagram wait a minute now in this diagram so speed you have got less supply of the blood to this area so when the less supply the more sodium reabsorption from here the movement of the filtrate will be lower down and more reabsorption of sodium will occur over this area and within the filtrate this is the brown yellow is the filtrate sodium will be lower down when this filtrate having low sodium enters into the loop of henle then it will take a u turn and move above move up and it will move up and by the time it reaches to the juxta glomerular apparatus where your where these macular densa cells are present so these macular densa cells they immediately sense that sodium amount of sodium is less coming up into the filtrate when this amount is less in the filtrate they will 
initiate a signal. This signal will reach to the next, that is the, your juxta glomerulus cells. These cells will produce immediately the renin. Renin will convert the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will pass through the lungs and it will be converted into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 has got a vasoconstrictive effect although, but it has got preferential. You can say the preference is given to this efferent arteriole. So this efferent arteriole is going to be constricted more. And your book guidance says that this area is dilated, but this is debatable. And this constriction, whenever the constriction is there, so what will happen? Actually, now move with me. Once this is the constriction, this area is constricted area. Now what happens? I will move to the other diagram. Now this is the efferent arteriole. This my cursor arrow, efferent arteriole, this is the efferent arteriole. This is the afferent, this is the efferent. Blood is coming from this area. It is moving from this area and 20% is passing through the part 1, uh, arrow 1 and remaining 80% is passing in, onward as it is. Now, if you block, suppose you are driving a car. Suppose you are driving a car and you are entering through this road and you are entering to this roundabout and then you leave this area through this area. Now, while you enter into this roundabout, you will find that this area traffic is blocked. Why this traffic is blocked? Due to the angiotensin 2. The efferent arteriole is going to be constricted now. So, if the traffic is blocked over here, then what will happen? You have to move through this area. You have to follow the route number 1. You have to follow the uh, arrow 1. So, due to the angiotensin 2 blockage, or you can, sorry, blockage is not the proper word, proper word, the constriction of the efferent arteriole will cause the more and more movement of the plasma towards the Govan capsule and this is known as the GFR. So, GFR is going to be increased now. Now, you can well understand this is the process through which the GFR is reversed. Now, I will move to the back to that diagram. This is we, we stopped the discussion over here, GFR. GFR was decreased. What will happen? The macula densa sodium cells, they are going to, macula densa, when the filtered will lead to this macula densa, they will, sodium will be decreased. And when the sodium will decrease, they will send signals to the juxta glomerulus cells. They will produce the renin. Renin will produce ultimately, first they will convert angiotensinogen into 1, 1 will convert it into angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 will cause the efferent arterial constriction and this efferent arterial constriction will increase this one. It has got negative weight and your GFR is going to be reversed now. So, uh, other pathway is that upfront arterial resistance is decreased, other pathways. So, here, this is also known as the tubuloglomerular balance, TG balance, tubuloglomerular balance. The afferent arteriole feedback mechanism, efferent arteriole feedback mechanism, summary of the renin secretion, renal perfusion, pressure, sympathetic, this and that. But this is a diagram of your guidance. So, this was all about the autoregulation of GFR and the stalling forces uh, concerned with the GFR. In the next lecture, we will see uh, what are the factors which are affecting the GFR? Thank you. Thank you very much.